Welcome to the Capital Discussions Roundtable. I'm Tom Nonamaker, with our guest Steve Lenz from Option View. Now, before we get started, a quick disclaimer that Capital Discussions is not a broker dealer or an investment advisor. This presentation is for educational purposes only. We don't know your situation and have no way of knowing what level of risk is appropriate for you. We're not making any specific trade recommendations. The risk of loss in trading options can be substantial, so please be aware of all of your risks prior to placing any trades. Hypothetical computer simulated trades are believed to be accurately represented. However, actual profit or loss may vary due to market factors such as liquidity, slippage, and commissions. And again, this is for educational purposes only. So with that, uh, welcome back, Steve. Uh, we were talking before we hit the recording button. It's always good to have uh, our good friends at Option View and, uh, and especially your presentations back to, uh, to share information with us. So well, welcome. Thanks so much, Tom. I really enjoy uh, coming here and uh, you know joining you guys for the roundtable. I uh, really uh, like your organization, the strategies you're doing. It's all good. I well, really thanks. enjoy this. Um, while you're sharing your screen, uh, Philip asked you, uh, can you give us any update on option view, what directions it's taking, uh, maybe at the end, or if it's a short answer, maybe now. Um, yeah, let me find, where do I, uh, oh, oh, I go to quick start. There it is. Yeah. Share screen. There we go. There we go. And then I go to um, slideshow. Oh, slideshow. Perfect. There we go. Um, you know, Option View is, uh, uh, you know, has been in business since 1983, and it's occupied a, a, a unique niche in the options trading world, which is high-end options analytics. And so, uh, Len Yates is our president and founder. He's the chief programmer, and he has just been continually making um, inroads and strides in, in refining the modeling. And I know you guys have probably talked about it a bit. I know you've had Jeff and and James on a, a bit and have talked about that. Um, but that's kind of the unique niche that we have. And he's just constantly making updates and upgrades. And sometimes some of those upgrades can kind of leapfrog ahead of things a little bit. And then he pulls back and, and reins it in. So it's constantly a work in progress to just try and stay ahead of our competition in terms of having the high end uh, look see as to what the future holds in terms of theoretical pricing. And it's just, I mean, just, I joined the option view in 1998 and looking back at the modeling we had then, which was cutting edge compared to now, it's just uh, light years, especially if you're into uh, horizontal skew modeling with regards to earnings. So um, that's kind of the direction that uh, we have taken. And, and I know Lens continually, you know, seeking to borrow straight into that world of, because uh, uh, that's where our edge is in the marketplace, to be honest. Um, Tom, should I just go ahead with this? Off yeah, we go. go ahead. Perfect. Yep. Um, so I, I, I manage the Discover Options Mentoring Program at, at Option View, and and um, I've done that for the leading up Option View's mentoring program for the better part of what 10, 12 years now, something like that. And in the last few years, I really have uh, dove into this world of volatility analysis only because I was just tired in my own trading and then in, in listening to other people that express their experiences, you know, in the, in the world of butterflies and condors, premium, you know, premium selling from a neutral perspective, um, you know, it seemed like we would have a time entry, you know, 75 days to go, 80 days to go, 42 days to go. So, you know, the days to expiration, um, you maybe wait for a down day or two down days or something like that. But, it just seemed like a little bit of a turkey shoot in terms of the market environment. And there wasn't a whole lot of work being done in terms of technical analysis being applied to the neutral entries. And so that's been my quest for a couple of years now. And I've tried a lot. I've tried seasonals. You know, what day of the week is better? Is there an edge to trading a certain week of the month around the labor report? All that stuff. And I've been trying to hammer at it from different angles. And so I came up with this that I'm going to present with you today. And I hope you enjoy this. It's uh, using edge analysis to determine favorable condor and butterfly entry points. So today we're going to review just general selling strategies. I'm preaching to the choir here, I know. I'll explain what the uh, volatility edge analysis is. I'll then show you how some moving averages can be very helpful in making your decisions as to when to enter the strategies. And then I'll do a current condor and butterfly timing report as of uh, the price action from uh, earlier today. So in the world of neutral selling, 
we have butterflies, condors, and everyone has their own way, their own secret sauce, so to speak, as to how you adjust when the market moves, right? And I, every time I get into this, I just got to think of one of my favorite movies of all time, Kung Fu Panda, because the characters in there reflect a different form of Kung Fu, the tiger, the crane, the monkey, you know, and then, and then there's a little grasshopper there. Forms of Kung Fu, they all have their unique moves in the way that they adjust in the heat of the battle, and that's kind of the way it is with butterflies and condors. So a typical condor, we're selling premium out of the money. I know you guys know this. Out of the money credit spreads, and we're dealing with the SPX exclusively here today. And when you analyze it, it basically shows you this, and, I, and we all kind of understand that if the price stays within a one standard deviation in general, you're going to make money by expiration. And if it flies off the handle in either direction, well, now you can lose uh, a, a tr you know, several times more what it is you're trying to make in the world of the condor there. And then we have the butterfly. And with the uh, 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 margining rules being changed a few years ago with Fenro, the broken wing can now be used as a way to uh, – balance the deltas much more efficiently than just buying extra calls or extra puts depending and so when you do a broken wing it can look something like this but you know but the condor and the butterfly all have the same thing in common is that we really want the market to stay you know compressed and ideally in a range so when you look at option views price chart um, you'll have the green area that reflects where you can make money and the pink and red area where you'll lose money and ideally we want the market to kind of chop around you know, in a, in a tight range. And generally, I'll just read this, premium selling strategies like condors and butterflies do best when the underlying market trades within a range and fails to move more than a standard deviation in either direction. Premium sellers should seek market environments when this is likely and avoid market environments when this is unlikely. I could say more likely or, or, or uh, uh, more more likely to, to chop around, basically, and not extend out there, okay? So I think we all kind of know that intuitively. Um, I know I'm talking to some folks that are quite advanced in this, and we're just seeking an edge. And so, you know, it seems to me, though, that a lot of the times the way we enter our condors and butters, and I'm speaking from experience in our own mentoring program, ignoring the market condition can be like flipping a coin. It might be the right time or it might not. And so you have to ask yourself the question, well, what is your edge at the end of the day? I mean, why do you have an edge? Why are you making money month after month? Okay, and then occasionally losing quite a bit. All right, what is your edge in those months when you're doing well? And for a lot of the folks, and, and I'm speaking from our own program as well, a lot of the times it is our ability to have a, a well a well back tested approach to making adjustments. You know the Kung Fu Panda. You know we have our own approaches: rolling in, rolling out, rolling profits in, rolling losses out, something like that. There's variations depending on what strategy, and all of those strategies. You know, there's condor strategies that are great. There's naked strangle selling I've seen that works. So many butterfly strategies. I know you guys, you know, and I've, I've examined the, the Jeep, the Weird Door, the, 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 the road trip trade. It's all good, okay? Um, but what I'm seeking for is something better on the entry than a coin toss. And so if you've ever lost twice in a row doing these strategies, if you're like me, maybe I'm the only one out there that's thought, good grief, what's going on? I lost twice in a row. I, you know, I could flip a coin better and, and have my entries timed better than this. So here's what I came up with, and it's a multi-part plan here in terms of examination. We're going to go through each one of these, all right? Um, understanding the implied 30-day move. Now, we'd say 30 days because that's what the VIX is. Um, it's really like 21, 22 trading days or price bars on the chart, okay, so we just, just so we understand. Notice I didn't say implied volatility. We're not going to get into the math of implied volatility. We're going to talk about the implied move coming from that implied volatility. I want to think in terms of how much the market moves, how much of a move was implied, how much actually came to, 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 to occur. And that's the second step. We're going to understand the actual 30-day move. After we understand both of those, we're going to then examine the historical distribution of those 
two types of moves. And I like to go back to January of 2000 because since then, it's, it's about as good a balance between bullish and bearish markets as you're going to get. Um, there's been more price bars spent in a bullish market since then, but at least that time frame encompasses enough bearish markets to at least balance it out as best we can. We're going to measure then the distribution of those two types of moves in the context of a technical setup. All right, and then we're going to measure that against the historical distribution. So we're going to basically look at the moves, and you'll see this as we go. But I'm, you know, and we're going to measure those distributions first historically from every close going back to 2000, and then we'll go to and just isolate certain technical setups since 2000, and then compare the two to see if the distribution's different. And if they're different then a positive or negative edge might exist, and that'll give us a, a better entry then. Okay? Let's, let's first understand the 30-day implied move. And so we're dealing exclusively with the S&P 500. Here's the VIX, and this is as of, I want to say, the 25th or so, 26th, 1, 2, 3. Yeah, I believe it was, uh, I think, uh, from last Friday, if I'm not mistaken. So you have the VIX. And um, that's, the VIX gives you just one figure calculated by the way that the, the algorithm that the SIBO gives us, right? But the VIX doesn't tell us the complete story. We have to go into the matrix to examine this. And I just want you to look at the vertical skew here. Now, can I, um, oops, time out. Um, sharing my screen, I can, I, I like to annotate just to draw stuff. You can start annotating now. Okay, so if you look at the, here, here's, here's option view, here's the calls, and there's the puts. The calls generally have a lower implied volatility as you get further out of the money compared to the puts, which as you get further out of the money, the implied volatilities get higher and higher. And so there's, this is a, it's called a vertical volatility skew, and it has existed in the S&Ps uh, in dramatic form since the crash of 87. And the uh, shape and steepness of this vertical skew can shift and change. But the bottom line here is that embedded in the VIX, when you drill down, is that you have the calls in the S&P cash are implying a lower volatility than the implied volatility of the puts. Okay? And so what we can do then, and, and, and the SIBO recognized this, and they came out with, now how do I... I have to then um, stop annotating, right? Then I can move. Maybe not. Time out. There we go. All right. So the SIBO came out with this symbol called SKEW. It's skew. And you can go to the website, look at the white paper, look at the press release and all that fun stuff. Um, and in, they give you a real good synopsis here. But basically, the skew uh, measures the the radicalness of the vertical um, skew that exists in the S&P cash options. All right, and it goes into tail risk. And basically, in environments where those out-of-the-money puts, those far out-of-the-money puts are really blowing up in price, the skew value is going to increase. And then in environments where those deep out-of-the-money puts are declining, then the vertical skew is not as significant, and then this skew value then goes down. So what I've decided to do is take this skew, and here's the skew there. It's in the middle um, right there. You can kind of – can you guys see my mouse? I don't know if you can yeah. – uh, Yeah, we can perfect. see it. Okay, good. So that's the skew value. When you take the skew value – um, and it took me a while to get the algorithm to come up with this, but basically I'm going to then use that skew to carve this VIX into two volatility numbers instead of one. One for the estimated upside move or the, the volatility of the, of the calls or the upside move, and then one for the puts or the downside. And so here's an example from the 25th where we, we broke it out, and the VIX I think finished up at 14. When you crunch it through the skew, you come up with a downside volatility of 16 and an upside volatility of 12.2. All right, so this becomes significant because then if you want to uh, really start 
you know, drilling down and measuring um, uh, how much the market is estimated to move, now we can be far more precise. Okay? And, and so here, what I like to do is convert that volatility number, 12, 2, and 16, into an actual percentage move that, that is implied 30 days from now, a one standard deviation level. So in this case, the implied down move stemming from the VIX and the SKU was a 4.6 move to the downside, and the implied move to the upside was at 3.5%. All right? So what I'm getting away from is just taking a VIX number or an implied volatility and casting a standard deviation um, that is equally balanced on both sides, like normally distributed, which is just a slight move. But no, um, really, when you drill down into the VIX, into the S&P 500 cash index options, what's being implied is a, an offset standard deviation level, or, or borders, is what I'm saying. So this gives us a far more precise standard deviation to then weigh our uh, volatility parameters against. All right, so that is how we come up with the implied 30-day move, a separate one from the upside versus the downside. Now, second step, let's understand the actual 30-day move going in the future. Now, I hope your screens can see this, but what I did is in the bottom screen, and I just ran out of colors and type here, but you see a dotted green line. All right, this is reflecting the actual 30-day move or 21 bars in the future. So, for example, let's go to this little bar over here. And I think that was probably uh, March 11th, something like that. The close was at 2022 in the S&Ps. And then if you were to go forward in the future, 21 bars, what's the highest level that it moved? And so if you just kind of just do a, a, a cursory look with your eyes, you'll see that that bar right there is the bar that's highest. The high of that bar is the farthest that the S&P moved in during the course of the following 21 bars. And when you crunch the numbers there, that's about a 53-point ascension in price in the index value. And 53 then roughly ref is about a 2.6% increase in, in value from the close of that uh, uh, on March 11th there. So from March 11th forward, it moved a maximum level of 2.6%. Now, that's, you can see that that's reflected then down in the, uh, uh, the bar in the, in the line here. Okay? Now, that's the actual move. It actually moved in the following 21 bars 2.6%. Now, notice... I'll just back out here. Notice that the current bars, we have no dotted line because we don't yet know what the future holds. So we can't really draw that line yet. So that line is constantly 21 bars in the past. Now, here's a question. Back on March 11th, what was the implied uh, move up at that time? Okay, so to answer that, we'd have to go to the VIX, crunch it through the SKU, come up with our upside implied volatility, back it into a percent move to the upside, and what we get then is right here, this is the green line that we saw earlier, and this, on that particular day, the implied up move at that time was 4.1%. So on that particular instance, implied volatility on the upside was higher than what actually came to pass. And that's a favorable outcome for those of us that like to sell premium for, uh, you, you know, using butterflies, condors, or any a host of other strategies, you know, where we're, try we're starting out basically delta neutral. So that's a favorable situation where the implied up move is higher than what actually came to pass. Okay, let's now examine the downside. Here's an example back from the beginning of this year. You remember how horrible January was, right? So let's just take an example from January. Back then on the 29th of December, the close was at 2078, and in the ensuing 21 bars, you can kind of see how low it went. I'm sure you can kind of just eyeball that, P 
pick it out right away as to what, the, what bar it is. It's right there. The low of that bar was 1812. We run the math. That's a 266 point uh, uh, decline in the S&P value. When you run the numbers out, that's roughly a 12.8% plummet in the course of less than three weeks. And you'll note then on the red line there, that's where it is. 12.8% is the value that is reflective on the red line. Now, of course, the question is, is well, as of December 29th, what was the implied down move at that time? All right, let's go take a look. In this case, when you take the VIX, run it through the SKU filter and come up with the implied down move, it was only at 5.6%. All right, clearly not a favorable outcome for those, for those that like to sell premium neutrally. This, was a, this turned out to be a very, very tough bar to have entered into this, uh, this situation here. And so what we're going to do is I'm, I can show you both the green and the red in one place. The upside is on the top, and then the red is on the bottom. That's the downside stuff. And we're still looking at December going into January. And if you look carefully on the uh, upside, okay, the market didn't really move up a whole lot during that time, of course, J December, January. And so from the upside perspective, there was some strong, safe, regions there where um, the implied up move was much greater than what actually happened. And then when you get over into February, you can see then that the up moves started, it st we started having big up moves there going into late February where the uh, actual dotted line, the actual volatility, the actual move was higher than what the implied was at the time. And so I'm calling these safe and dangerous regions here safe and dangerous. Now let's go to the downside move. You can see clearly in December the danger zone, you know, cue the um you know, cue the movie, what was it? Uh, uh Top the Tom Gun. Cruise movie, right? Danger zone. There you go. Um Top Gun. So you got the uh uh situation in December where clearly the actual move much was much higher than what was implied and then later on when the market started, you know, coming back, vol was pretty high. Implied volatility was high on the downside, and the actual uh, down move was much lower, and those were safe. And so what we're going to do is for all the bars in which any danger zone, green or red, appear, we're going to color those red. And the safe zones, those were, that were safe both on the upside and the downside, those are blue. And so in this way, we know that the red bars were bars in which the market from that point forward resulted in some tough times for premium sellers, all right, for neutral premium sellers. Those blue zone, the blue bars, those would have been good bars to enter a condor, butterfly, or any of those strategies. All right, so we can back out, and I just want to make the point that again, we don't know currently, you know, what our what the what today's bar, the today's bar is black. We won't know for three weeks whether it's going to end up being blue or red. All right, but the idea here is is that we're going to, and I think what's my next slide? Okay, here's the thing: how do we determine the likelihood that this current black bar will become either red or blue? All right, and that's kind of intuitively what I think we all want to know is if we, we need a better edge. We know our kung fu, but we just, you know, and let me, let me digress a little bit. I'm a youth football coach. I was telling uh, Tom earlier, too, in my role in my community, I, uh, I'm in community politics here, and they wrote me into one time doing a, um, a charity boxing event. Hey, you know, come in, you know, the, the gloves are huge, the headgear's great, you won't get hurt, right? Famous last word. <laughs> Famous, famous promise or famous last words, right? Well, I go and start training, and then it turns out, well, no, this is a USA-sanctioned boxing event. you got to get your doctor to sign off, and we're going to raise all this money for the kids. Like, oh, well, you know, I'll tell you what. If you're in a boxing match, and I, they, I ended up boxing a guy near my age. He was a little older than me, same, out of shape. We had fun, but I'll tell you, he decked me pretty good, and I decked him pretty good, and it, it, it hurt. But I ended up winning, 
um, by a unanimous decision. But it was three, three one-minute rounds, and I was surprised I made it. I trained and all that. But here's the deal, and what, what my point is, is that it's, it, it's a lot easier to win at boxing when you're boxing someone worse than you. And if you're a football team, I'm a football, football coach going into the high school ranks just this year, it's a lot easier to play a football team that's worse than your team. If you're playing a team that's better than you, you know, they got Barry Sanders on their team or something, it, you're in for a long day of it. And so likewise, trading condors and butters, doing our adjustments and everything, it's a lot easier doing it in a market environment that's favorable versus unfavorable. All right, I think we know that intuitively, but I wanted to make that point. We're trying to figure out a way to make sure we trade when the bars are likely to convert to blue than red. So that's what we're gonna try. We're gonna first measure the distribution of the actual and implied, and then we're gonna get to the technical setups here in just a second. So let's measure the historical distribution of the implied and actual. So here I've painted a whole bunch of bars uh, going back years, and I'm gonna do this going back to January of 2000. Um, and you can kind of see a pattern here if you start focusing in that the, uh, clearly the, the red bars are happening in periods of, of uh, great market volatility, and it's obviously tough. Um, but what I'm gonna do then is determine the percentage of bars that are red versus the percentage of bars that are blue, real simple. That's how we document the historical distribution. Where the actual volatility was less volatile than implied, I'm painting them blue, 67% of all the bars going back to January of 2000 are painted blue, all right? Where in instances where the actual volatility turned out to be more than what was implied, all right, upside or down, um, 30, rough, 33%. So you're looking at roughly two-thirds of the time it turns out to be blue, one-third of the time it turns out to be red. And who likes trading when it's going to turn out to be red? It's, it's, it's a tough, tough go of it. All right, now, hopefully, if your kung fu is good enough, you can weather the storm and, and eke out of it with minimal losses. That's the idea behind the adjustment approaches we use, right? But boy, it'd be better, it'd be nice to be able to uh, uh, knock these numbers down a little bit. I think you would agree. And so that's what we're going to do now is we're going to try and focus in and find a way to to trade at moments where the bars are likely to be blue and not red. So what Technical indicators can we use to knock out some of these reds and focus in on indicators that will give us the blues the most often? So the idea is, is that we're going to apply a technical indicator such that the blues occupy a far greater amount of the population than the reds in a greater ratio than two-thirds, one-third. All right, once again, I'll repeat that. We're going to use a technical filter to try and create a population of bars that are predominantly blue than red and in a greater ratio than the two-thirds, one-third. So we're going to measure that distribution after the two types of moves occur after a setup. And so in this case, I'm just going to take, and then after we have that, if the two are significantly different, the two-thirds, one-third versus our setup, ratio, well then we might know that there is a positive or negative edge. So let's just look at this and what I'm going to do is let's throw on a moving average or two, all right, and try and cut out some of these reds here. So here's a 200 day simple moving average and before you look at the numbers or anything, just note that we're cutting out a sizable chunk of here let me get my mouse there it is you know we're knocking out the red here we're keeping some of the blue here unfortunately but we're knocking out the red here a lot of red here this red here we're keeping blue here here and here but I think you'll see that just from this visual that the, that the bars underneath the 200 day simple moving average there's more red bars than blue I guess is what I'm saying. And so, so now when we look at this and we calculate the percentage of bars 
over the 200-day simple moving average. Of all the bars above the 200-day simple moving average, 70% of them are blue, where the actual volatility was less than implied. 30% of them uh, actual was more volatile, actual was greater than what was implied. So this 200-day simple moving average gives us roughly a 3% edge. Instead of 67, we're now up to 70% blue. All right? Let's try and improve on that a little bit more. So that's a 200-day simple moving average. Let's now go and look at a 50-day simple moving average. And you'll see here that we're knocking out a much greater chunk of the red over here. Okay? We're knocking out, but we're, we're, we're knocking out some blues here too, though. That's not, that's not as good, but we got rid of a lot of the reds here. Most of the reds in this nasty part back you know, from uh, the fall of 15, and then a good chunk of what happened here at the beginning of this year and again uh, later on. You see that? So in this case, of all those that are greater, of all the bars above where the close was above the 50-day simple moving average, 72% of the bars above the simple day of the 50, 72.5% um, are blue, 27.5% are red. And so that's a 5.5% positive edge over the broad historical. Now, and I don't have a slide for this next point. I thought of it as we were getting ready. What's the inverse of this? What if you were to trade butters and condors when you were underneath the 50-day simple moving average? These would invert over, okay? These would invert over. Instead of having a 5.5% positive edge, it would go back the other way. There would be a 5.5% negative edge from that baseline of two-thirds, one-third. So instead of operating in an environment where 67% of the bars are blue, you would be in an environment where 61.5% of the bars are blue. And I wish I, I thought about, I'll have to add that to this presentation later. So you got a 61.5% environment if you're underneath and a 72.5% environment if you're above. Pretty, that's a significant difference when you pencil out you know, you know, you're long term trading this way. So I hope that kind of clicks that, hey, you know, the, 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 the swing between being above and below is quite substantial because we're just weighing it against random or excuse me, historical of numbers. But I think you can kind of see the significance of this when you run it out. Here's another idea I had. I said, OK, let's take the bars that are not only above the 50, but also over the 20. OK, what does that give us? Now, there's going to be fewer bars, certainly. Uh, and the more you start whittling it down, then, of course, the fewer bars you have to enter in general. But there you can see you're now at 73.5% blue. And so that's a 6.5% edge. And so um, and what I found is varying from, uh, and I did a, a much more broad moving average study. and, and whether you're simple or exponential doesn't really make that much difference. They're very, very close. Okay, um, you can you can pick either one. That's your kind of preference. But I hope that this kind of gives you some parameters just to kind of uh, get you in the ballpark of of favoring an environment. I think you'll find that it, you know a bullish environment defined by 50, 200, or even doing something like this. Um, you're going to definitely operate in an environment that's more favorable in the S&P cash options. Hopefully that kind of gives you a, a little ballpark, you know, rule of thumb to use in your own timing of these entries here. Um, okay, and then finally, I'm going to apply this. I want to show you something that I'm doing here every weekend now. And I'll show you this at the end. Every weekend, uh, I, I do a video blog entry. It's, on, it's for free. It's on YouTube. We call it the Prepared Mind. Uh, Frank Fahey started this Prepared Mind text blog. And uh, I'm doing the video version. Um, and what we do is a uh, 
Condor and Butterfly Timing Report. That's what we're going to call it now. The, uh, the weekend Condor and Butterfly Timing Report coming from Friday's close. And what I'm doing is instead of just taking a moving average, I'm going to take uh, as, uh, other parameters as well and and then just see if that set up how well it did in the past in terms of being blue or red. Okay? So let's just take today's action as of 10 o'clock central um, this morning. Okay? Price action. The high was lower than yesterday's high. So was the low. The average true range was less than 1.5% of, uh, uh, of the SPX. And 1.5% kind of cuts it through over the last several years of ATR, one-day ATRs, average two ranges, meaning that the today's bar, at least as of 10 o'clock, was, was fairly narrow. It was, was definitely uh, under the 50th decile in terms of being fat or narrow. We're above the 40-day simple moving average. I like to throw in an overbought or oversold indicator as well. At the time, stochastics was above 60 and under 90. And I also said that it's underneath its three-day, and this is a 15, 3, and 3. It's underneath its three-day average as well. 15, 3, and 3 would be the parameters there. So how many, you know, how often since January of 2000 did this exact same market environment occur. And what I did is in my Metastock program, I colored the bars red. And you could see there's several going back just in the last few months. You know, there would be hundreds going back Jan January of 2000. But of these bars that are, that are selected here that meet these parameters, how many of them were favorable versus unfavorable? And as it turns out, when you go back in time, walk forward, it turns out to have a six and a half percent edge. All right, over and above historical, the, the, the just the uh, the random historical distribution of the red and the blue bars. Okay, so that's just coming from today. It looks like today is a uh, you know would would historically give you a little bit of an edge. Does it mean that it's going to that it's going to chop around and channel? No, all we're doing is trying to beat the coin flip. Remember that. We're coming back to the coin flip. We want to try and have an edge. All right, we want to try and make it so that we're boxing against an opponent that is worse than us, playing a football team that's not as good, being in a market environment that is more likely to be friendly than unfriendly. That's, that's all we're doing here, is trying to uh, ascertain an environment that is simply more likely to be friendlier than unfriendlier. And uh, applying the moving averages is a real good start. I've been, you know, examining other studies using other indicators, um, DMI, ADX, that kind of thing. And for our mentoring students that join us in my uh, uh, members only section, kind of a thing, we have, or uh, you know, we have uh, much more detailed, in-depth studies along these lines. But this is, I think, a great introduction to uh, what we do here. You can go to YouTube, look up the Prepared Mind, and you can see my weekend posting where we'll do the Condor Butter timing report as of Friday. And then later on in the next few weeks, uh, the idea is to roll out a daily service on the uh, uh, timing report as well. But the, at least the weekend version will be free to those that go in here. And you know, if you subscribe, then you're alerted. And I usually post it on Sunday nights. Something like that is when it appears here. And then later on, Jim Graham goes in and shifts the title around and does his stuff. But uh, Sunday nights is when I end up posting this. All right. Looks That's all she you. wrote. Yeah. <coughs> uh, Philip asked, uh, have you uh, tested buying premium on the negative edge days? I have not. I have not. That would take... Uh, uh, that would go against my nature and the nature of a lot of our students and the strategies. But um, it, it, I, I think you, you would certainly be trading in environments where it's more likely to be uh, uh, more volatile, less friendly to the sellers, more friendlier to the buyers. And certainly I think that there's some good uh, opportunity there. However, how you manage that trade is going to be a completely different you know, ball game. I, I would imagine that it would beg the conversation about gamma scalping, something like that, 
You know, if you're going in a more mar if you're in a more volatile market environment, you could do neutral strategies where you're uh, scalping the gamma, and that's something market makers were uh, always very adept at because their costs were so little, and uh, it, it could be a very profitable way to trade. But I have not personally researched that angle. Uh, I know uh, Casey Platt had mentioned that he knew uh, a, a couple traders that just made their living off of gamma scalping. So yeah, there were, were some that did it. Not an easy game though. Um, yeah. we, we had another question. Uh, when looking at the rut matrix, it shows uh, Volti, SV. Um, let's see, maybe it's easier. Can you see the chat, Steve? You know, let, let me get out of this. Um, I'll just paste it in there so you can see it instead of reading the whole thing. I'd have to um I'm sharing my screen. There should be that little chat icon up there. Oh, let me click that. There it is. When looking at rut in the matrix, it shows the Volti S V S V A V N I V or average IV, calls IV, puts IV. Is option V using R V X when the matrix is set to rut when VIX is set to the SPX? Um, if you're in a matrix and you're looking in that bottom right corner of the default setup in any option view matrix, it's going to show you the numbers and those are coming from the compilation of the IVs generated in the matrix. It is not pulling the VIX numbers that are calculated by the SIBO. It's not pulling anywhere except from the actual IVs being uh, reported in the matrix. Yeah, it's next to the Greeks at the bottom. Exactly, uh, Ray. It's it's uh, those are those, all those values in option view are exclusively coming from whatever IVs are in the matrix. So, if you have a matrix that has your default auto strike is set to small and moderate, okay, um, your numbers down there are going to vary from someone else that may be in their option view, they've set their default auto strike settings to uh, large, and they're bringing in every strike they can. And, and you know, and in this case, those, those out-of-the-money puts might really run those IV numbers way up on the average anyway. But yeah, those are being calculated straight from the matrix across all, uh, and however many months you're showing too. All the months, all the strikes go into that average number. A great I question. That, I think that's it for questions, though. I think you must have done a great job, Steve. There's no, no, no questions here. <laughs> or, or they're sleeping. One of the two. <laughs> no, wake up, attention. everyone. Wake up. <laughs> they're paying attention. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess um, if there's no other questions, uh, we can always wrap it up early. There's nothing that says we have to go an hour. You know, we've been going about 45 minutes, so... It's okay with me if you want to uh, just wrap it up, unless you have anything right. else to add. No, that's fine. I just express my appreciation for uh, you having me on, and uh, if this is along the lines of anyone, if anyone, uh, if this kind of uh, speaks to you a little bit, you know, check out that uh, prepared mind at the YouTube channel we got going on. It's fairly new. We've only been at it a month or two now. Okay. So. Oh, um, Jerry first said, "Open it up to questions." Well, Jerry, if you have a question, type it in the chat or forever hold your peace. <laughs> oh, let's see. Alex said he was digesting the the Fed statement rather than sleeping. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> it looks like the markets, the SPX is up about uh, eighty cents, so it hasn't been too disastrous. No. Okay. Well, lots of thank yous. Um, yeah. Oh, Brad says, are you using any other technicals than a simple moving average? Oh, I've been exploring several. Um, yeah, the, the moving averages are a great place to start because remember you want to carve out the red bars and leave it and, and create a population of bars with as many blue as possible. And so, uh, but I've I've been exploring uh, two areas, MACD and also um, uh, the DMI stuff by Wells Wilder. Those are the two areas of inquiry that I've been focusing in on primarily. You know, MACD is simply a, it's moving averages, just a, a further iteration and. Uh, more refined, and so there's some promise there. Have you uh, done anything with multiple time frames? Um, well, in this context, 
Well, because the VIX is a 30-day VIX, um, that's kind of frozen. You can't really – I mean, you can apply the VIX number to shorter or longer time frames, but you would be kind of drifting from the – from the precision that you have. The other thing to do, and I've done, and I'm this is part of it too, and is, is more advanced, is doing the nine day VXST. It's the nine day VIX as opposed to the 30 day VIX. And so everything you saw today on the VIX, I've also applied to the shorter term VXST as well. Um, and so those numbers are all, they're all a bit different, but the, the same thing definitely applies to the VXST. Um, the SKU, though, that I'm using on the VXST is a 30-day SKU number because the SIBO doesn't yet, to my knowledge, have a 9-day SKU number. If they do, then that'll be ideal, but it doesn't have that at all. Um, I see Brian was asking if you have any uh, information on moder modernizing the Option View user interface. Are there any plans for updating that or changing uh, it? Um, I, I I haven't talked to Len or Jim about that in a long time. To my knowledge, at this point, no. The uh, focus is primarily on the guts going on behind it. The model, most most notably, the modeling, uh, uh, the going on to make that more precise. And uh, uh, but um, yeah, I haven't seen I haven't seen any talk about the interface in a while. Okay, and then uh, Mike asked about an EMA, but I think you said EMA or SMA is fairly close. Yes, yes. I ran a, a big study going, and, and uh, I ran exponential versus simple, and the, the differences were minuscule in terms of carving out those uh, red bars versus the blue. Yeah, and it didn't then, really uh, matter. And then Sir Rush said, to, reiter to reiterate again, above the moving average is favorable condition for selling delta neutral option strategies. Correct. Correct. It's more favorable. And underneath those moving averages is less favorable. Uh, let's see. Ray says Bollinger Bands might help. Um, Brad, do you look at overall increase or reduction in vols? Uh, increase or reduction in implied volatilities? Is that what he's asking, Tom, you think? Uh, could be. Yeah, Brad, maybe clarify that a little bit. Uh, yes, yes, Ivy. Um, increases or reductions in? No, I'm only looking at the volatility on a given day, the implied volatility up and down, and comparing it to what actually occurred. Now, thinking out loud here, use. I mean, I mean, we can use any kind of technical indicator or, or condition. The, I mean, the the whole world's open here. So, one one interesting thought, because I know this a lot of a lot of folks say, and I've I've heard this quite often. Well, don't put on a butterfly or a condor until after a down day. If the market's going up, wait for a down day. That way, implied volatility is a little higher, and then so that would be something to look at. And that's kind of on my. Uh, um, list of various indicators to examine is let's just take all the bars above the 200 day moving average that are coming are, are a down close after an up day something like that and if you took all those particular bars what would you have would there be more or less blue bars than historically that you have by random something like that I mean, looking at volatility is above average and maybe increasing or below average. And that's kind of the same thing a little bit, because usually when the S&P goes down, implied volatility goes up, right? And so you can, but you're right, we can apply technical analysis to the VIX, okay, and use a moving average of the VIX or consecutive days that the VIX has gone up or down. All that would be great. Yep. RD, um... Option view works really well in Apple computers running on parallels. That's my understanding. If you have, if you have an Apple computer and you're running the parallels emulator, I think they call it, then um, because we have a lot of clients using Apple. And yeah, I've simply... actually done that with VMware Fusion. It's a virtual Windows OS inside your Mac. I think he's asking about uh, a native Mac capability. 
Oh, no. Yeah, I don't think there's plans for that. Yeah, just run parallel, but don't ruin the code. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't ruin the code. <laughs> you know, another thing I found is uh, Amazon has these, uh, um, I forget what they call them. They're, you get, it's like 25 or $30 a month for a remote desktop, essentially. So I've actually put Option View on there and tested it, and it works fine. So you can just oh. remote desktop into one of these virtual uh, workstations, run Option View from any operating system, and you don't even have to run a virtual operating system on your Mac. That's that's great. John Dory, Sandbox. <laughs> What's that mean, John? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. Well, I know like in programming, if you have a sandbox area, it's more like for testing. Oh, really? I'm. You can tell I'm a fish out of water in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> Not a programmer. I, I, it's all, all right. I can do to program in Metastock. And that's the program you're using with all your charts, I take it. Yeah, yeah. I, I do all. All this work is done in Metastock. Yep. Very good. Yeah. All right, Steve. Well, I think we're uh, we've run out of. Uh, the questions for your presentation. So okay. uh, why don't we wrap it up today and uh, we'll invite you back another time when you've got more to share. I appreciate it, Tom. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks everyone for sticking with us. I'll get this posted as soon as possible. Thanks again, Steve, and we will see everybody next time. Mm -hmm.